Hi, I'm Gary Ralph, and this is another lecture in the series for History 101, Europe and the World, Part 1. Um, I'm, I've been talking, before the second exam, I was talking about the economic revival, and then in the last lecture I talked about the intellectual revival, but actually this is part of a kind of general ongoing revival of Europe, and it doesn't really stop at any particular point period, as we shall see, the 1300s, there's a big setback, but it keeps continuing to develop. But there are certain events and certain people that are kind of marks, uh, marking places to, to, for us to be able to look at this development. And one of them has to do with the kingship of Henry II of England. Uh, we don't really talk much about Henry II in the United States, but he's really one of the most important English monarchs and actually one of the best known, partly because he, a couple, at least a couple of movies have been made about his life or about episodes in his life. Uh, the Lion in Winter and Beckett. I will be talking a little bit about Beckett. Um, and in both of these famous movies, Henry II is played by Peter O'Toole. <laughs> uh, he wants, Peter O'Toole once made a remark that he, he could have made a career out of making movies in which he starred as, Peter, as uh, Henry II. Um, and I'm bringing that up not because it's important in history, but only in order to show you what an important King Henry II was. Now, in recent times, he has been slightly reevaluated because in the 19th century, the people portrayed Henry II as this guy who kind of single handedly recreated England in uh, the modern way, uh, which he didn't do at all. I, he's, uh, the things that he did during his reign were things that had been starting up before he became king and went on changing after he became king. But there are people who, kind of hold back and, and try to stop change from happening. And there are also people who guide the change so that it heads in the right direction and happens productively. And Henry II was the second of those two kinds of people. He was a productive ruler who was forward looking. Whether what the changes that he made were really changes that he made with the intention of making a new English legal system, for instance, it's hard to say. Um, he may have just been making the changes because he thought they were convenient and because they worked well for him. But in the long uh, view of English history, it turns out that what he was doing, the changes that he was making, were significant changes that turned out to make England the place that it was in following centuries. Now, you may remember my saying that all of the kings and queens of England are descended from William the Conqueror. And you may also remember my having said that it wasn't always through the male line. It was sometimes through the female line. And we have a very good example of it right here. This is actually taken from your textbook. But you see William at the top. William had three, uh, let's see, two, two sons and a daughter. Uh, Henry I reigned as king, but Henry I had no male sons. And if you didn't have any male sons, uh, having a daughter who could be queen was considered definitely second best back in those days. So Matilda, his daughter, married uh, the, uh, a Frenchman named Geoffrey Count of Anjou. Um, but also, Henry I had a nephew, um, Stephen, who was also wanting to be king, even though he didn't have uh, particularly direct right. And the period between the end of Henry I's reign and the period of, and the beginning of Henry II's reign was a period of civil war in England. Very destructive. However, it all ends up in the right hands because uh, Geoffrey and Matilda have a son, Henry II, who um, turns out to be king of England. Now, Geoffrey... In earlier days, had conquered the area of Normandy, the area that William the Conqueror had originally come from. Uh, so when Geoffrey married Matilda and gave birth to Henry II, Henry II inherited both the crown of England and this territory in Normandy that his father had conquered. By the way, because 
He, uh, the last name of Geoffrey is Geoffrey of Anjou, the English dynasty that he began uh, when Henry II came to the throne. is sometimes referred to as the Angevin dynasty after Anjou. Uh, not only that, but after Henry became an adult, he married Eleanor of Aquitaine. Uh, Aquitaine is an area in western France. It's the, the area that abuts the Bay of Biscay. Um, and of course, when he married her, he got control of all her territory too. Uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, by the way, was a really extraordinary woman in her own right. Uh, in The Lion of Winter, she is played by Catherine Hepburn up to the hilt. Um, so when Henry becomes king in 1174, he has to keep track of England, which he inherits as the grandson of Henry I, Anjou, which he inherits through his father, Geoffrey of Anjou, Aquitaine, which he has control of because of his wife Eleanor, and Normandy, which his father Geoffrey of Jean Anjou had conquered. So he's got a lot of territory, and he spends a lot of time going back and forth uh, across the English Channel. He spends a lot of time in what we today would call France, uh, but then it was a uh, English territory. It's, um, the some of the some of it Henry held sort of as a vassal of the king of France, but he considered it to be his own territory. So Henry is not in England as much as he would need to be in order to create a stable government, but he really needs a stable government. Uh, furthermore, the civil war that had happened before he came to the throne, the civil war between Stephen and uh, Geoffrey of Anjou had been very destructive, especially of royal power. Uh, people were not really honoring royal power very much anymore after this war. So he had to establish uh, a firm control over his English territory. Um, and there were also, as I suggested, these ongoing trends that Henry, you could say he took advantage of them and capitalized on them, or you could say that he went along with them because they were trends that were in demand by his subjects. One of them was a reform of the English legal system, which in the, at the beginning of the 1100s, it hardly even qualified to be called a system uh, because there was a bunch of local courts. Some of them were just courts that were run by the lords of the local territory. And, you know, if you had a disagreement with somebody, you would go before the Lord and you would say what you thought. The other guy would say what he thought. And the Lord would say, okay, uh, I don't really know which of you is telling the truth. So instead, we are going to have a trial by ordeal, which involved things like um, somebody getting thrown into the water and see if you drown. Uh, two guys, the two guys on the two different sides having a battle, like a, a tournament, you know, one kills the other. Uh, other interesting things where they, they would give one person a hot poker to hold. And depending on how long he could hold it, that meant that he was either telling the truth or not telling the truth. This seems like a very peculiar way to us today to determine the outcome of a court of law. But the idea was back in those days, if you were lying, God would punish you by making you drown in the water. <laughs> and uh, the, if you were uh, in the right, God would save your life by making you float. And it was, you know, it sounds like a joke today, but this is the way they really determine things. And in fact, it was continuing to be used even after Henry, the first, Henry II's reign. It was not abolished until somewhat later. But... So the, it was not that Henry II morally objected to the idea of the trial by ordeal, but it was not very efficient. Uh, you know, it's if you if you have people decide a court issue by everybody going out to the local lake and throwing somebody in, that's time consuming. And so um, Henry instituted the idea of trial by jury. Um, again, this was one of those things that you see occasionally cropping up in. English history before Henry, Henry II, but he was the one who really made it a, a standard feature of English uh, law. You get, uh, if you are being accused of a crime, then the local powers choose 12 people who are basically on the same social level as you are, I put your peers. Uh, this group of people is assigned the job of determining the facts of the case, trying to determine what actually happened. The judge, 
justices of the peace or whoever it was, would still be the one who decided what kind of punishment you received if you were guilty. But there was no more of this business of trying to prove the truth of what you were saying by making you hold a hot poker. Saved a lot of time, as well as being not quite so ridiculous. And also, Henry was trying to establish a consistency of law throughout England. He didn't want it to be the case that if you committed a crime in one part of England, you received some kind of punishment, and if you committed the same crime in another part of England, you would have a completely different punishment. He wanted to establish a common law that would apply to all of England. There is a big problem with this. Um, at that time, and for a considerable time before that, the priests of the Christian church had had their own legal system and their own uh, system of courts. It was, as I say, canon law, it was called, and the canon courts. The idea was that if a priest committed a crime, he would not be tried in the ordinary everyday courts that everybody else was tried in. He would be tried in a special court that was only for priests, and his fellow priests would be judging him. And as you might expect, the fellow priests were not going to be very hard on it because they were all priests together, you know. So uh, the priests would not get very big punishments for things that would gotten, would he, he would have gotten a big punishment for if he'd been punished according to the common law. Henry II does not like this. He, he is determined that his common law is going to apply to everybody in England equally. Um, and he gets into a big fuss with the head of the Christian church in um, England, Thomas Becket. Thomas Becket is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Canterbury had come to be the sort of capital city of Christianity in England. You remember my talking about Augustine of Kent before? Some people refer to, his, to him as Augustine of Canterbury because he was the one that settled in Canterbury and made that the center of the Christian church. Thomas Becket had actually been a good friend of Henry II. At the, at the beginning of the movie, Becket, I think it's Richard Burton who, who plays Becket, um, Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton are palling around and having lots of fun and being very good friends. But Becket is determined to maintain that priests can only be tried under canon law by canon courts. And he gets into this huge controversy with Henry II. One afternoon, Henry II is walking around with some of his knights, and he says more or less aloud, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Basically, I, you know, just sort of saying into the air as they're talking to himself, why doesn't somebody get rid of this guy? Well, he's surrounded by people with swords, <laughs> his, his supporting knights, and they are not slow to take the hint. So they go to the cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral, and kill Becket right there in the cathedral in 1170. In fact, there's a famous play that T.S. Eliot wrote called Murder in the Cathedral, which is absolutely about Thomas Becket. Um, in a way, this backfires because the people in, in England really love Thomas Becket, and they even if they didn't love Thomas Becket, they don't think it's such a good idea to have an archbishop murdered in his own cathedral. And Thomas Becket becomes a religious hero. Um, people travel from all over England to visit the place where he was murdered in order to do Thomas Becket homage. And of course, once Henry II realizes that this is the result of his having assassinated Becket, he says, oh, you know, people are taking me too literally these days. I didn't really mean somebody should actually go and kill him. Well, he probably did, but... Um, Anyway, the, the tradition of making a pilgrimage to Canterbury, remember my talking in the, when I discussed the Crusades about the idea of pilgrimages. Well, the pilgrimage to Canterbury becomes a big thing for Christians in England to do and from elsewhere. Um, you may have heard, if you study English literature, of a book called The Canterbury Tales, which was written, you know, a century or two later. Uh, and it's called the Canterbury Tales because it's a series of stories that are told by pilgrims who are on their way to Canterbury to worship at the shrine of Thomas Becket uh, in the Cathedral of Canterbury where he was murdered. So, Thomas Becket's murder is a big deal. By the way, it doesn't resolve anything in terms of the conflict between common law and canon law. There continues to be controversy about that for a considerable amount of time. 
Okay, let me, I want to go back and show you the, you know, Here we are going. Here's the uh, genealogy. After Henry dies, the next person to be king is Richard I, nicknamed Richard the Lionhearted. And he may have been lionhearted and a wonderful person and an all-around great guy, but he didn't do his job because once he was crowned king of England, he almost immediately left for the Crusades and never came back. <laughs> so as... As a king, he was very much of an absentee king. Um, nice guy, maybe. But uh, most of the duties of being king were left in the hands of his brother, King John, who was not a nice guy. Um, how many of you have seen movies or stories about the Robin Hood myth? It is a myth because there probably was no person named Robin Hood. But Robin Hood is supposed to have lived in England at the beginning of the 1200s, and the general format of most of the stories is, I'm running out of time, let me start this again.